Thanks for tuning in to the third podcast with best-selling true crime author Gary C. King. Today's podcast will cover the topic of Driven to Kill, the story of child serial killer Wesley Allen Dodd. Be forewarned, some content within this podcast may be unsettling to some listeners. Enjoy. Hello, this is Gary C. King again. Today I'm going to be talking about Driven to Kill, my best-selling book about child serial murderer Wesley Allen Dodd. I'd just like to point out this time that I'm a father of two children who were very young at the time of Dodd's rampage. They're adults now. It was my primary motivation for writing the book was the fact that I had two small children and that I wanted to keep them safe. I wanted to see other parents keep their children safe because if you don't really understand that there are creatures out there roaming the streets, predators, looking for their next child victim, there's just going to be more and more children that will be victimized. Parents really need to know this stuff. And it's for that reason you should read this book. You need to read this book if you're a parent because it really gets you inside the mind of a child serial killer, a predator who had no real limitations to what he would do. You'll be shocked, you'll be appalled, but you really need to read it, especially if you're a parent. I can't emphasize that enough. All of my books are available via my website as well as these podcasts, truecrimeking.com. Gary, tell us about how the story of Driven to Kill first came about. Driven to Kill first came about because as a parent, we were noticing in the news children, boys in particular, that were being abducted. There were three in all over a period of a couple of months, and it was quite frightening. No one knew what was really happening. Two boys were murdered in Vancouver, Washington, in a park there. It was very scary. And then a little bit later, another child was abducted from a school playground. He was really young, like two years old. And as parents of young children, I felt like we were being held hostage by this unknown maniac who was raping and killing children. So, afraid to let our children outside to play, even without supervision, I decided early on that I was going to have to write about this case, if and when it came about that the person was identified and apprehended. As it turned out, A young man named Wesley Allen Dodd was apprehended. He was caught trying to abduct a fourth victim from a Camas Washington movie theater where a children's movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, was playing at the time. Fortunately, a concerned citizen saw what was happening when Dodd attempted to pick up and carry this boy out of the restroom in the theater, and he followed him, chased him down. The rest is history. Dodd was arrested, of course, and eventually identified as the perpetrator behind the other child killings. At that point, I decided I'm going to write a detective story about him. So that's what I did. It took me a while to do the research, but I put together a fairly lengthy story about Dodd's case. The editor at True Detective at the time, Rose Mandelsberg, was so appalled by what she read not bad writing, of course, haha. Uh-huh. just the facts of the case, and uh, she encouraged me to actually write a book about it. She contacted an editor at Kensington Books, Paul Dennis, whom I knew as well, and because of her urging, I decided to go ahead and, and write this book. It was not a lengthy process because, as many people know, a lot of the more current true crime cases, the editors and publishers like to put the books out quickly. Describe the murders and how the victims were found. Dodd's first known murder victims were little brothers Cole and Billy Near of Vancouver, Washington. Their bodies were found along a hiking trail in a large park in the city. Each one had been stabbed to death and sexually abused. It was a gruesome crime scene, but it was even more disturbing because these were little boys riding their bicycles along hiking trails through this wonderful park, very secluded, nice setting. They were something they've done many times before. When their bodies were found, it was quite a shock to parents everywhere. It was just absolutely a horrible situation. People were naturally devastated by what was found in the park that day. The police, of course, pulled out all stops. They were not going to stop at nothing to find this killer. And they hoped before he struck again. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Little Lee Isley, three-year-old boy, was playing with his brother on a Sunday afternoon at uh, Richmond Elementary School in Portland, Oregon, across the river from Vancouver, a short period of time after the Near brothers were murdered. 
Lee Isley just disappeared, vanished. Uh, nobody knew what happened. His brother went home and told his dad he's gone. Turned out that he got in the car with Dodd, and Dodd drove him to his apartment in Vancouver under promises of food, candy, toys, this sort of thing, anything that would naturally interest a three-year-old kid. And so over the next several hours, Dodd abused Lee Isley, did terrible things to him while he was alive. He stuck a rod into his penis, pulled it out, and stuck it back in again, and did these sorts of things, just horrible things. And it's hard to talk about, really, because sexual abuse of children is just a thing that most people aren't prepared for. At any rate, he eventually killed Lee Isley, strangled him into unconsciousness, and allowed him to regain consciousness, and did this again. And much of this information, incidentally, is from Dodd's own admissions and my interviews with him, which we'll get to later. So after he finally killed Lee Isley, he kept Lee's body in his apartment. He stuffed it on a shelf in the bedroom closet, put pillows in front of it, and went to work. He went to work, did his eight-hour shift, came home and Lee's body of course is still there so he takes the body out abuses it some more he does this until the body begins to decompose and at that point he realizes he has to get rid of the corpse and he drives it out to a remote secluded location near Vancouver Lake he dumps the body there and it's eventually discovered by an older gentleman who was out hunting another shock another boy this one younger than the others has been murdered nobody knows who did it all the cops knew is that they had a very sick individual that they were looking for. Tell us about how Dodd was caught at the movie theater in Camas. The case really didn't come to light until one afternoon in Camas, Washington, down the road a bit from Vancouver, about 14 miles or so, at the Liberty Theater. It was playing a movie called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Dodd went there with the intent to find another victim. He found the victim in the men's room, the restroom. A young boy, Dodd, followed him in there actually went up to him, grabbed him, and tried to carry him out. The kid was kicking and screaming, making a lot of noise, which is what kids should do in those kinds of situations. And someone else, another moviegoer, an adult, saw what was happening, and so he followed Dodd. At first, Dodd tried to make him think that it was his relative that he was dealing with, but something just wasn't right. He followed Dodd till Dodd's car broke down a few blocks away couldn't get it to start again. By this time, the Good Samaritan had called the police. The police came and did the usual inquiries. The kid told them that he didn't know Dodd. So they arrested him, and that's when he was actually identified as a potential suspect in the other cases. We understand now why you were interested in writing this book. Where did you begin? Being a detective story writer, a true crime writer, I decided I had to write about this case. Even though crimes against children are just absolutely appalling to anyone, and probably even more appalling to people who have to research and write about it, I decided that this needed to be done, not only so much for my own needs as a parent who felt like he was being held hostage by this psychopath, but as a service to other parents. I wanted to give people a glimpse of what kind of predators are out there lurking in the background and waiting for children. So that's where the detective story idea came up. I wrote it, sent it in, they published it, editor liked it. She was so moved by it, she wanted me to do a book. I agreed with her that a book needed to be done, so I contacted the true crime editor at Kensington Books at the time, Paul Dennis, and he was immediately on board with the project. He, he wanted to do it, but he wanted to do it quickly. We had to actually research and write the book within about a 30 to 40 day period. So I set about doing the, the preliminary legwork on it, During that time, of course, I had other stories to write for the magazines. So I went to the Clark County Sheriff's Department in Vancouver and interviewed another detective for a National Police Officer of the Month story that I was doing for Master Detective magazine. It was a great venue to highlight or showcase a good cop's work. I had used these in the past to develop good positive relationships with various police departments. At any rate, at the conclusion of the interview, the detective looks at me and says, Hey, you know, we've got Wes Dodd upstairs. Did you want to talk to him? And I was kind of taken aback. The idea of the book was already there, had the contract. Sure, I'll be glad to talk to him if he wants to talk to me. He said, Well, let's see. He takes me upstairs to the jail. It's a modern pod-like jail, circular in construction. Dodd's in one of these pod cells, apparently asleep at the time, so they go over and ask him if he wants to talk to this true crime writer that's writing a book about him or planning to write a book about him. Dodd immediately is excited about meeting someone to talk about it. 
Now, there's a reason for his excitement. There's a reason for his willingness to talk. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but one of those reasons is Dodd had no friends, and no one liked him. He was just one of these people that, especially after his arrest... Dodd has agreed to have a discussion with you. Where did this discussion take place? Among the things they told me about Dodd was that he liked to lie in his jail cell and masturbate constantly obviously fantasizing about his horrible deeds, reliving them in his mind. And this would become clearer to me and others later as I explored Dodd's mind. At the time that I was told this, it was kind of difficult for me to fully fathom what was going on here. The guy lays in his bed in his cell, masturbates all the time, and here I'm going to go meet, meet him and deal with him. They take Dodd out of his cell. They move us into an interrogation room, really just across from his cell, not too far away. So we're taken into this interrogation room. They lead us inside. Dodd sits down at a table. I sit down across from him. There's nothing dividing us. It's just a normal interrogation room without any protections. I believe there's a camera that videotapes the whole thing. They lock the door, and we're there alone. I was allowed in there with my briefcase. I wasn't searched, which kind of surprised me. I could have been going in there to help Dodd escape or to provide him something for a weapon to use, any number of things. But I guess the relationship that I developed, they didn't see the need, or maybe they hoped that uh, I would carry something in there and do away with him. I don't know what was actually the motivation there or lack of motivation for them not to search me and my possessions. That's the way it turned out, and I shook hands with Dodd, which I was reluctant to do. His hands felt soft and cold and clammy. I don't know if that's just his natural skin tone or if it was because of the incessant masturbation and anything that he might have used. Whatever the reason was, it was a very uncomfortable feeling, but it's something I I had to do anyway. So we sit down and we talk for the next three to four hours, and it was quite unnerving, the things that were said. Dodd basically described himself to me as a boy-next-door type of guy. He was an enlistee in the United States Navy. He liked to help people, supposedly. Neighbors, they looked at him as the boy next door. Very clean cut. Not unusual at all for Dodd to stop and help a person in need, as long as it wasn't a child. He related all this to me. It was just part of the background of his own life. And then he would gaze up at the ceiling, close his eyes, be silent for a minute or two, and then he would come out, back down to earth, whatever he was doing. He was obviously in some kind of fantasy state. He would relate to me some of the most horrible things I'd ever heard as far as his crimes were concerned. He described to me in great detail how he killed the victims. He also described to me in great detail his plans for future victims. He had a diary of death that he'd composed, and he wanted to share this with me and told me that if I wrote a book about him that I had to at least study his diary of death, which he signed some papers and agreed to let me see anything that he wanted me to see, including his police files. So I managed to get a hold of a copy of his diary of death, and it was appalling. He had schematics of a torture rack that he had built, a very crude torture rack where he was going to tie his next victim down on, perform surgery while the kid was alive and conscious, including cutting off genitalia. It was almost more than I could handle. I sat there nonetheless and, and listened to this. And then in the next moment, he would go back into his personal history again. It was just kind of back and forth like that for the time that I spent with him. It was very disturbing, probably the most disturbing interview I've ever done. How did the meeting end, and how did you feel afterwards? At the conclusion of about three and a half to four hours, as I stated earlier, I decided to conclude the interview, really. I could have gone on all day. Dodd was happy to talk and talk and talk. I wasn't happy to keep listening. I had to put an end to it. It was only the first time that I would deal with him. But nonetheless, at the conclusion of the interview, I thanked him for talking to me, and I told him that I would do my best with the research, and I would portray him accurately in the book. He had no problem with this. He seemed to have a certain motivation now that he was captured, that he wanted his story told. He wanted people to see him for the monster that he was and he just wanted to make sure that I got it all right. I assured him I would. So we parted ways. I left, thanked the cop who put me in the room with him to begin with. I hurried on downstairs, and my first stop was the men's room. I had to stop and wash my hands. I felt very unclean, having been in this room with Dodd for so long and having shaken his hands twice, once upon meeting and once upon leaving. And that was all I could think about. Even during the interview, I was thinking, I've got to get to the restroom and wash my hands. I just felt compelled. That's the way my first episode with Dodd ended. 
Discuss with the listeners about your late nights with your editor, and please describe writing the book, including the last chapter about his execution. As soon as Dodd's trial was over, and he really didn't fight the authorities at all, he wanted to get it over with. He basically wanted to be executed, so he didn't contest anything that that he was charged with. just wanted to get it over with, so he had a, a fairly short trial, but as soon as it was over with, I set about to write the book. I studied his police files extensively. I interviewed the police officers who arrested him. I interviewed the police officers who worked the cases in Vancouver as well as in Portland. So I had really two sets of case files. I had the Lee Isley case file to examine, and I had the Near Brothers case file to examine. I took my time as much as time as I could anyway and went through these carefully and also studied his diary of death, which was absolutely an appalling document. But it basically outlined a lot of his personal history, some of the things that he had already told me, but he talked about how he had sexually abused kids for much of his adult life and much of his non-adult life as well. Most of these victims were younger relatives, cousins, neighborhood people, and it consisted of sexual abuse in various forms. Of course, he described it in great detail. Please describe Dodd's background and how he slipped through the cracks of the legal system. So Dodd's background was quite extensive. He had been arrested several times for standing in front of the windows of his parents' homes, naked and masturbating in front of children as they would go by. Police would come, they'd slap him on the hands and say, you shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. And it's my personal belief that he slipped through the cracks of the system for most of those types of crimes because he himself was a juvenile at those times. It could be that no one really wanted to push the issue so hard that he would have this record following him around the rest of his life. Maybe someone hoped he would change. I don't know. Whatever the reason was, he managed to continually get slapped on the hands and slip through the cracks and basically get away with it. These incidents, in my opinion, were a form of crying out for help. Dodd possibly could have been saved if he had received help early on, but he didn't. They just let him go, and he just advanced. He got worse and worse as he got older. So now I've set about writing the book, and it was not an easy book to write just because of the subject matter. It also wasn't easy because the publisher wanted it in a very short period of time, working night and day, researching, writing, sleeping in between whenever I could catch a few hours of sleep. Similarly, the editor in New York, Paul, was doing the same sorts of things. He was spending a lot of late nights talking to me on the phone about material that I'd sent in because I was sending in the book to him piecemeal. He was editing it, and we were just working back and forth forth like that. So it was not unusual for him to be in the office at three o'clock in the morning in New York, midnight for me in Portland. And this went on until the book was finished. Tell us about how Dodd wrote to you, asking you to attend his execution. Before the book was finished, Dodd had contacted me through the mail and asked me if I would attend his execution. It was to occur in January of 1993. It was something that I didn't really personally want to do. On the other hand, I felt a sort of obligation to attend the execution, plus it would be the final chapter of the book. Keep in mind that this all happened very quickly, including his appeals. When, when, when the book was nearly done and this request came in for me to attend his execution, I contacted the editor in New York and told him about it. And He, he thought it was a great idea that what better way can you put an ending to a book like this than to attend the killer's execution. So he flew out from New York to Walla Walla, Washington, the state prison there, and and I met him over there, and we had a joining hotel room where we could communicate back and forth when we needed to, because I was still working on the book, naturally. But the night of the execution was very cold, almost sub-zero, lots of snow on the ground and ice. We went to the prison, and it was a media circus almost trucks and vans from all over with their satellite dishes and we were allowed inside the prison walls and that was creepy in and of itself because I'd never been inside a prison before and to uh, be taken in and have these big steel doors closed behind you is just a feeling that you'll never forget and then we were led into this room that they had reserved for the media. In this room were reporters from all over. Most of them were local but there were reporters from all over. We all participated in a lottery system where we were each given tickets, lottery tickets. They would draw the 14 tickets. Whoever's numbers came up would get to witness the execution. Well, fortunately, my number never came up. I didn't actually get to witness it. Neither did my editors. He seemed a little disappointed, but we persevered. We stayed throughout the night. Dodd was executed pretty much on schedule by hanging. 
the benefit that we had from a reportage standpoint was I was allowed to talk to the witnesses who actually saw Dodd hang. It was kind of chilling, kind of unnerving in and of itself to hear the descriptions because they were led into this small room and they could view the death chamber on the other side of the glass behind curtains. You could look upward and see the, the gallows and Dodd was up above. At one point they open the curtains, Dodd drops through the trap door, he hangs there for a moment, told he soiled his pants, which is normal, and then they close the curtains and Dodd was declared dead. It was something that I really was happy I didn't have to see. It was bad enough listening to it. We got the details, which I included in the book, Driven to Kill. I referred to it as my eyewitness execution report, because that's really what it was. Talk about how you felt after the execution of Wesley Allen Dodd. Afterwards, I felt a little sick, a little remorseful that I actually went there. Because over a short period of time, I had actually developed a relationship of sorts with this monster who actually had a good side. If you could actually see a good side to him, and it's difficult for most people to be able to form an opinion that he actually had a good side because of the horrible things that he did. But I was able to see a little bit of both sides of him, more of the monster than of the all-American boy next door. But nonetheless, the fact that he was now dead it was not a very pleasant feeling. Most people would probably be happy someone like Dodd had been killed or executed. There was a part of me that was glad that he was gone, that he paid for his crimes, but there was also a part of me that felt a little sad. And I think it was more out of how could a guy like this, so young, really screw up his life to the extent that he did and end up at the end of a hangman's noose when he could have avoided it all. And then there's also the problem of, I'm really not a capital punishment person. I've never been a proponent of capital punishment. I'm not an opponent either. I'm sort of on the fence. I always felt like here was a guy so sick, so twisted, and so willing to talk and eager to talk. Had he been kept alive, his mind could have been studied by psychologists for years, and some good may have actually come out of it. What were the personal after-effects of Dodd's execution for you and of writing the book? After the execution and I went home, I had nightmares for a while. They were a little bit bizarre. Sometimes I would dream about actually seeing the execution even though I didn't. Based on the descriptions, I guess was enough for me to have these kinds of nightmares. And I would also awaken in the middle of the night. I would hear our doorbell ring, and I would jump up out of bed and think, well, there's somebody at our door at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'd go to the door, and there would not be anyone there. And when this first started happening, I thought, well, maybe it's neighborhood kids pulling a prank. But this went on for some time. And it got to the point where it was very annoying as well as unnerving for me because there was never anyone there. And the doorbell probably really never rang. It just rang in my mind enough to make me wake up. I still don't know if that had anything to do with me going to the execution or what happened or maybe just a combination of writing these stories for so long was finally catching up with me. I don't really know. It eventually passed and I stopped having the nightmares and things got back to normal. But this went on for a few months. Please discuss the reaction you received from the victims' families. So when all was said and done, the book was published to much success. It became a regional bestseller, and you could find the book literally everywhere. The boys' fathers, the victims' fathers, were supportive of what I had done, but at the same time, they were very disturbed that Dodd was getting all of this attention. I'll give you an example. They would go to the grocery store, and there would be Dodd's picture on the front of my book at the checkout stand. This was very difficult for them to deal with. But they also knew that good could come of it if enough parents read the book and they understood my motivations for writing it, that I did it as much as a tool for parents to understand creatures like Dodd as much as anything, and they were very supportive of that, to the point where they even went on TV, local talk shows with me, to talk about the case and to promote the book, along with police officers who worked the case and a couple of psychologists who were familiar with Dodd and his problems. I just want to wrap this up today by apologizing in a sense for being somewhat morose during this podcast. It's just that this is very disturbing subject matter. Having to dredge it all up again after all these years brings back a lot of unpleasant memories for me, but this is something that I nonetheless felt compelled to do because I still believe that much can be learned 
as far as parents are concerned or by parents so that they can better protect their children if they're aware of these things and creatures like Dodd. All of the details are, of course, in the book Driven to Kill, which is available as an e-book. It's not an easy one to get through. It's a very difficult book to read. You're going to be shocked. You're going to be disgusted. But nonetheless, I think you can see the reasons why I wrote it once you actually read it. With that, I'd just like to thank you for listening again. I'd like to also mention at this time that I have a, a new book, a compilation of stories. It's called Crime Scene, True Stories of Crime and Detection. It's now available as an e-book and should be available very soon as a paperback as well. There are 15 stories in all. It may be the first of a few compilation books that I will do that's available now through the usual outlets. I appreciate you listening to this podcast. Please check out my website, truecrimeking.com. Also join me on facebook.com slash truecrimeking, as well as on Twitter. I'm always happy to communicate with readers. It's always a pleasure. We'll be doing this again soon. Please get involved. Stay tuned.